uh, here to uh, lecture today. He's from Matthews, Indiana. He grew up there, and uh, his family still lives in uh, Matthews, Indiana. He attended Miami University at Oxford, uh, Ohio. From there, he went to work for uh, the Architects Collaborative in, in Boston. And his, one of his final projects in working with the Architects Collaborative were the interiors for the uh, AIA National Headquarters uh, at the Octagon in Washington, uh, which uh, you may or may not know, uh, also very important on that, on that project was uh, Professor Wyman of our faculty. Well, uh, hometown boy made good because we got him out here to the College of Architecture and Planning, and he stayed with us one year and made better by going off to Yale to get a uh, master's degree in uh, architecture and uh, also in history at Yale. He was there two years, and then he uh, took a job, and I think that was uh, four and a half years ago, with uh, the uh, Nova Scotia Technical Institute, Technical College it's called. Uh, you may have seen in our library upstairs, every month or so we get the research reports that are done by the faculty of the uh, Nova Scotia Technical Institute. He teaches at the present time their second year design, which is uh, uh, it, since it's about a six-year school, would correspond to third or fourth year design. Is that right? Or would they be doing something similar, uh, something uh, similar to our second or third year work? Uh, last year, as he will tell you, he took a tour of about 20 uh, students to China and to Japan and to hear an uh, uh, account of that time in China, we welcome Larry Richards. Welcome. Should I wear this over my head? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There. I just got to pull. Thank you very much, um, Dean Sappenfield. It's very nice to be back here after several years, and nice to see that the school is healthy and thriving and lots of exciting things going on amongst the students and faculty. And I think one of the most exciting things, particularly exciting to me, is this um, idea of planning a student trip to the People's Republic of China in the very near future. Um, I was very pleased to be able to come here and share with you some of our experiences. Uh, it still is a fairly unique thing to be able to go to the People's Republic of China. It's changing very rapidly with the United States opening up relations with uh, China. Uh, but I think if you can at all get your act together and uh, accomplish the trip, it will certainly be one of the most exciting and one of the most worthwhile things you will ever do. So if I can be in some way of some minor assistance in sharing with you some of the things that we saw and did, um, then uh, I'll be very uh, happy about that. Um, I'll start with slides in a moment. I'll tell you just very quickly how I have them organized. As you can imagine, uh, many of you have traveled. One comes back with uh, a great number of slides. It's difficult to know how to sort them out, how to arrange them. I hesitated to do just a travelogue to say, uh, this is Peking, and then we went to Nanking, and so on and so forth. I could have used that uh, kind of organization. Instead, I decided to do it in a more topical way. I have approximately five pairs of, uh, or rather, ten categories of slides, 
uh, with about five pairs in each category. And the, the 10 categories will cover um, one, our students in China, two, transportation in China, three, the landscape, four, agriculture, education, science and technology, architecture, art, gateways, and finally, stars in China, which is a particular interest to me. I'm doing some research on uh, decorative use of stars in China, and I'll share uh, some of that with you later. So if we could have the slides. <clears throat> Just to tell you a brief, uh, a little bit about our organization, um, we have uh, our School of Architecture is small. There are 150 students in the school. In Term 7, which is roughly third year, we have the option for students of traveling abroad. And we have, um, we encourage students to come up with their own ideas about where they would like to go. We have some already existing programs in uh, Europe. We've had trips to Africa. But in 1975, uh, group of students became interested in the possibility of traveling to the People's Republic of China. At that time, there were about five students. They were in their second year. And um, really, without contacting the faculty, they decided on their own to go to Ottawa. Canada had the, already had uh, full diplomatic relations with China, so it was not too much of a problem to contact the, the proper people in Ottawa. Anyway, they went to Ottawa and through a series of visits and letter writing, uh, surprised the faculty by coming back with approval for an 18-day study tour for 20 students and faculty. And at that time, they asked if I would be interested in coordinating the trip. I said I would. We eventually combined it with 11 weeks of study in Japan, which rounded out a 14-week study uh, program. Uh, so the excitement built over a period of 18 months from the time the students first visited Ottawa and started the, the letter writing uh, until we boarded the plane in Tokyo and flew to Peking. This was in September, uh, about the 1st of September in the fall of 1977. Now, a, a tour in the People's Republic of China is a different kind of tourism, a different kind of travel from the type that many people are accustomed to because it's very highly organized. The people who organize the tours see it as an opportunity to um, share and to educate people from different cultures. and. So we were almost all the time, we were in group situations such as these. On the left is a meeting in uh, a ceramics factory, uh, in the meeting hall uh, in the ceramics factory. And on the right is uh, a tour through uh, a, a silk factory. And in these slides, what I wanted to do was uh, just to show how important the sense of group was to us because we were together so often and very every day we would have a series of these uh, briefing meetings such as the one shown on the left when we would meet with union stewards, uh, various representatives of the factory or the school and uh, start with a briefing session and then tour the particular facility, come back for uh, a debriefing um, session. Well, some people have asked about how did we dress, what did we look like, uh, some kind of everyday questions, which are important. We, we pretty much, most of the students did the things that they would ordinarily do in Halifax or Toronto or, or New York or wherever as tourists. And I, in going through slides, I discovered I had two back shots of, of uh, Eric Fiss and where, with his red, very North American or 
European looking uh, satchel on his back. And very often these things did attract attention and um, the Chinese are very curious about how we dressed. Blue jeans are still pretty unusual. I think we saw a couple of people in Peking with blue jeans on, kind of wondered where they had, had gotten them. Um, but we, we did uh, attract attention, not, we weren't trying to, but inevitably if one dresses sort of normally by our standards, uh, one attracts a certain amount of uh, attention. But we went on doing ordinary things. There, there are a lot of students in the group who were accustomed to jo jogging every morning. And I remember one morning when four of them went running off at 5.30 from our hotel, jogging the uh, mile up to Tiananmen Square in Peking and back in their uh, orange and yellow and very colorful gym shorts. And, and I'm sure a lot of Chinese uh, heads were turned, but uh, that, that's certainly not, not an unacceptable thing to do as a tourist. But little by little, it seemed the students, the longer they were there, they began fitting in. Um, they enjoyed trying on and even buying clothing that the Chinese wore on an everyday basis. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I should check. Yes. It's okay. Here on the left is one of our students, Duncan Coates, trying on a construction hat, the <laughs> woven variety. And on the right, we're in a meeting with a, a group of uh, community workers. These are sort of para paramedics. And that's also Duncan in the blue shirt uh, and, and Margaret kind of blending into the whole situation. So the longer we were there, the more uh, comfortable the students felt and, and the more easily they uh, became part of the whole scene. Here, uh, one of our students is taking photographs in a nursery school. They, they organize a lot of little performances so that when one tours a nursery school or a kindergarten, uh, it usually ends with a show. And these little kids were amazingly uh, talented. Uh, as an architectural aside, I should mention that we had a lot of discussions in places like this about such things as the use of color, the use of materials. We had some tours and meetings which were set up purposefully for our interests in architecture and planning. Other times we would be in a situation where the focus was on, on say, nursery schools and education, but inevitably uh, questions about the, the environment would come up. And they, in this situation, they stressed such things as the importance of calm, soft colors for the children, colors which would not frighten the children, which we discussed in some, in some uh, depth because it seemed somewhat different from some of our ideas about colors in elementary schools uh, where, at least in, in recent years, we've had the idea that very strong, very intense color uh, was a positive thing. And from their point of view, um, I don't know how much research it was based on or, or what the basis for it was, but they felt very strongly that intense or very bright colors were totally out of place in the environment, uh, in an environment for young children. So you see these mostly soft blues uh, and cream color, uh, cream color uh, walls. The, the lighting was very interesting. Um, I'll go into some of that later when we go into the topic of, uh, of architecture. On the right, some of us visiting in uh, a peasant's house in a rural area. I use the word peasant not in any degrading way. I use the word peasant because that's the, the word that they used in referring to uh, a certain uh, segment of the society, mostly in the rural areas. We were able to visit um, three family living situations, one, uh, two urban ones and a, a rural one. And with the two, we always had two, we had two interpreters who traveled with us for the entire 18 days. And then in each local situation, we would pick up two um, local people. So we always had four interpreters with us. Some other shots of the Nova Scotia Technical College students was not always uh, intense, an intensive educational situation. We did have lots of time to relax and play. And here we're enjoying ourselves on a cruise on a, on a lake. The 
second group of slides focuses on transportation in China. We flew to China from Tokyo on uh, China Airlines. At that time, they had about four 747s. They have more than that now, and they have quite a few more ordered from the United States. Um, the flight was quite interesting. I was telling Dean Saffenfield at lunchtime that it was different than, than any flight I'd ever taken in the United States or North America because uh, such things as trays of green apples came around, kind of beat up tea kettles of tea. We were given little lapel pins from the China Airlines, bags of candy, chewing gum. Uh, it was like a party. I felt like I was at a, at a, at a birthday party and uh, everyone had quite a good time. There, there were 20 in our group and the rest of the plane was filled mostly with uh, Eastern European businessmen and quite a few people from the Canadian Wheat Board uh, going to China to uh, make wheat deals. Um, the flight was fine until we landed, very rough landing. We hit very hard and all the oxygen masks fell down and, and uh, it was a very, <laughs> a very surprising uh, arrival in more ways than one. Within China, we traveled mostly by bus but from within the cities, but between cities we traveled by trains. The trains were, were very comfortable. We had small compartments with constant hot tea coming in, slippers, playing cards. There were potted plants in the compartment. Um, certainly it wasn't typical. Uh, we walked through other parts of the train and saw people sort of piled on top of one another. Um, we were treated really very, very well. And you'll find you'll feel very spoiled when you go there. Uh, we even, at times, even said we felt that it was just more than we expected in terms of food and comfort. We were almost embarrassed. Uh, and they said no, that we were their guests and we deserved special treatment just as if you were having a guest in your home, you're going to put out probably your best, uh, your best china and have a nice meal. And, and uh, so we were guests. That wasn't intended to be a pun, by the way. <laughs> well, the typical means of transportation for the Chinese is, is bicycle and bus. In Peking, with a, a population of around 8 million, there are 2.5 million bicycles. It's just mind-boggling, the numbers of bicycles. Shanghai has a very serious traffic problem with bicycles now, incredible traffic jams. And the, the noise, the, the sounds in China are so different. And one of the sounds you, re, set, you begin experiencing is this background noise in the city of bicycle bells constantly jingling. And some of it is actually to, keep, to get people to move out of the way. But we also realized a lot of it is just fascination with this kind of toy. And it's just, they just ride and just jingle, 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 you know, kind of constantly. <laughs> We did, we were able to go out on our own when we had time in between tours or in early in the morning or in the evening. And riding the buses was quite an experience because they're very crowded. They cost a few pennies to ride on, uh, but incredibly crowded uh, transportation systems there. Now, the thing I don't have a slide of, I misplaced, I don't know where my slides are at the moment of the I think they're out on loan of the Peking subway. There's a new subway system in Peking. We rode on it for a, about an hour and saw quite a few of the new stations. It's computerized, very quiet, very beautiful stations. The stations have uh, a lot of marble, very expensive, uh, both by our standards and by theirs, very expensive materials. And we asked why, as you'll see later, do you use very almost shoddy materials for some of the housing, but you're willing to spend, uh, to, to put marble in the subway stations. And they said, well, when it comes to building public buildings for all our people, then there should be no, no limits on cost because those places are for all people and they must last and be very durable. And so the, the materials in, in the most public places were, were very, very substantial. Um, other means of transportation, uh, and included boats. Here on the left is a, a ferro-concrete boat. 
we went through the manufacturing plant where these boats are made and enjoyed two days in um, a small town, a farming town uh, called Wusi. And this is a photograph on the right. It's a kind of Venice um, where most of the transportation and movement of goods in the city is by uh, canal. Uh, more traditional means, um, a lot of trucks, rather old looking trucks that seem to dominate the roads, and very strange looking cars, strange looking to me, such as the one on the left. There are no privately owned cars. All the cars are owned by the state, and they're mostly used by government people, um, and very often have drapery around them, such as this one. And then there are these little tiny uh, kind of, I think they're really elaborate motorbikes with little cabs around them that are used within, within the city. But the roads are still pretty, uh, pretty barren in terms of cars uh, and trucks. So by our standards, uh, they're relatively few. Uh, cars and trucks. They do have, however, um, very, very modern trucks being developed. Um, we saw some of these in use the, the on some construction sites. These particular ones we saw at a place called the Shanghai Industrial Exhibition, which is a place that has kind of one of everything that's being developed in China. And um, you can see that, for example, this truck um, on, on your left is as modern and, and as sophisticated as any you might see around here. And they're developing vans and minibuses and uh, other means of transportation. The landscape we saw uh, changed dramatically, uh, both from the different types of urban cityscapes, landscapes, to the rural ones. And even though we traveled in a rather small geographic area, we traveled from Peking to Shanghai, and the five places we visited were all pretty much on the main train line between Peking and Shanghai. And if you look at a map of, of China, China is roughly the size of the United States geographically. Um, the, the distance we traveled was something like from uh, Boston to Atlanta. And, but within those uh, distances, we saw an amazing variety of, of landscape. On the left is a view from my hotel window looking out over Peking. And there is a new ring, kind of outer ring around the city which follows a new superhighway and which follows the new outer subway ring. Um, a, a new ring of high-rise apartment buildings. We visited some of those under construction, some which were completed. And it's, it's forming a very tight network because there's the transportation loop with the highway, subway, and housing, and then all of that's tied into an underground network. Uh, and in this whole inner city area, there's a totally underground defense network, and most of the new schools have underground classrooms which are tied into the underground network. The, the new housing uh, is tied in, so uh, there's this, this very elaborate system and the possibility of a huge percentage of Peking going underground very quickly. We only saw one small part of that. Had we known about it, we were rather naive, we didn't know this existed. Had we known about it and requested it, I'm fairly certain that we could have seen much more of it because an Australian group there at the same time was able to see a lot of it and told us quite a bit about it. So I suggest that uh, as your planning develops, you, you might request seeing uh, this underground network. Um, we saw traditional things, very important um, monuments, uh, such as the Great Wall. We saw it the first day we were in China, and 
You've seen, I'm sure all of you have seen pictures of the Great Wall, but like most things, um, experiencing it was uh, something that we could never have uh, imagined. And um, we had a picnic there. They packed, we, we went in a bus with a car following us. The car had box lunches pre-packed, uh, kind of fried chicken and orange pop and, and things like that. And so we had a picnic at the Great Wall and um, then we're able to climb and, and roam around on the wall. And Chinese are, are, are becoming more and more uh, tourists themselves within their own country. They're very fascinated with cameras. They always wanted to see our cameras. They're just now getting into um, 35 millimeter cameras. That is, it's just becoming available as a kind of mass market, mass produced uh, item. And other types of landscape, we visited a lot of uh, intimate uh, gardens, natural rock formation, and uh, they have a great kind of public works. All over China, these kind of public works projects, rebuilding parks. And some, I don't know how well these are focusing because I'm not able to focus them remotely here. So somebody might adjust some of those a little bit. Um, and again, uh, we were out on, on the lake several times uh, and were able to get some sort of picture postcard shots. <clears throat> a part of the landscape which I particularly enjoyed and an item which I want to shift now is, is the agricultural um, rural areas. Um, we had not specifically requested visiting a rural commune. We had asked to visit urban communes, but we were delighted when we found out that we were going to spend an entire day on the West People's Commune. Uh, I want to just, I have a book of, of personal, uh, it's a personal diary from China. I collected a lot of facts. I didn't want to go into great detail because there's so much information to kind of share with you. But in this case, I want to give you just a few of the facts on this commune, both because the facts are interesting, but also because it's very, uh, very much an example of the kind of factual information that they were very pleased to, to give us and that we were constantly being, uh, some of the students thought it was being bombarded with. It depends on how one looks at it. This particular commune, this rural commune, um, and I'm showing here uh, just a, a gateway, a detail, and on the right, some um, kind of greenhouse, very kind of crude planting uh, areas. It was established in 1958, 90 square kilometers, and the people are organized into production brigades. There are 43 production grade b brigades, and the brigades are organized into production teams. There are 257 teams. They have 15 major undertakings. And an undertaking would include something like uh, fruit production, pig production, and so on. There are 13,800 households, 67,500 people. So it's, I guess, I'm not sure what the population of Muncie is now, but maybe somewhat smaller, but not too far from the population of Muncie, 67,500 people. Um, the majority of the, the uh, agriculture land is in grain fields uh, and some in vegetables and orchards. There was a lot of reference to the um, poverty and misery here before uh, 19, uh, before the commune was organized in 1958. Famine and begging, 358 people, uh, 385 people dying of starvation. And these, we were constantly uh, given this, this kind of information. And then endless statistics about 300 ditches built, 889 wells, 24 trucks, 320 tractors, on and on and on. 33,000 head of pigs. 2,000 draft animals, 6,000 sheep, 50,000 poultry, and now we have enough to eat, enough to wear, and uh, things are so much better. 
People have radios, clocks, sewing machines, wristwatches, and of course now the thing that's interesting uh, is that people are saving money, and people are able to save a certain amount of their income. They want televisions very badly. Now typically a production brigade um, will have a television, which is shared, but more and more people are able to buy um, their own television sets. This particular commune has 43 primary schools with a to and 32 middle schools with a total of 13,000 students. There's a hospital on the commune. commune. They have their own uh, foundries and machine repair plants. And we, saw, we visited all of these things, the schools, the hospitals. We went through the orchards. We went through the pig farms. And um, having grown up on a farm and having raised pigs, uh, in Matthews myself, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that day. Um, there's one, one of the pigs. Now, we asked them a lot of things, like, how long does it, when does a pig go to market? And they told us at approximately 180 pounds, and then we asked, how long does that take to fatten a pig? And they told us about a year. Well, for those of you who have grown up on a farm, I think now, uh, with our developments in agriculture that take something like four months. So you can see it takes them about three times as long to uh, feed a pig for market as it does us. But they use no um, supplements or uh, additive nutrients. The, figs, the pigs are fed on um, fodder, apples, and waste material and they save every little grain of rice that's left from the people's meals. All of, every little grain is saved and fed to uh, the pigs. Now, the, archi the rural architecture I found to be some of the most interesting. On the left is a peasant uh, painting. It's part of an exhibition that's been traveling around uh, North America and Europe, but it shows the kind of a uh, very organized system um, here shown very artistically. But we, the pig farm we visited was organized exactly like this with outdoor pens, uh, rows of planting, actually squash and things planted in rows amongst the pig pens, so, which could be fed directly to the pigs, and uh, roadways. It was a really rather, even though it was at a maybe primitive level in terms of the, the buildings, um, the system, the interrelationship of the parts was, was rather, from our point of view, rather sophisticated. And uh, of course, this, I, this painting's very interesting because it's very symbolic of, of, of the kind of equal but different attitude uh, in, in China, where every pen is identical but within the pen, you'll note that every, there are different combinations. There's, there are mother pigs with baby pigs and pairs of pigs and single pigs. And so although there is uh, an equality within this very rigid framework, there's the opportunity for different kinds of expression. And um, on the tour and through the interpreters, we had these kinds of discussions every day because the Chinese, of course, are interested in uh, our understanding of their um, political and social system. And their political and social system is, um, as ours is in McDonald's, uh, their political and social system is reflected uh, very clearly in things like the way they organize and the way they artistically depict things like pig farms. So there was this constant kind of high-low thing going on, uh, even at a pig farm, between uh, the political nature of the situation and just having a great time jumping into the pen. I really frightened one of our uh, guides by jumping over the fence into a, a, a pen with one of the pigs. Um, having grown up with them, I, I, they didn't bother me at all, and I think she was uh, horrified because she was used to dealing with tourists, I think, who weren't from a rural background, and she, was, she was, got very nervous about that. This is a pumping station on the commune, and on the right, uh, some of their new tractors. Most of their tractors are very small in scale. Uh, agricultural mechani mechanization is very high right now on their list of priorities, but it's 
what they're doing now, instead of providing one very large tractor, they find that because of the scale of their operation, it is much better to provide 10 small tractors. On the same rural commune, we visited the, the hospital and saw uh, such things as uh, acupuncture. The people were tremendously warm. Um, you just couldn't have better hosts. We had a, it took us a long time to get accustomed to being applauded. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, it's just a strange thing to, to be leaving and they, they applaud. It's just a, a social <laughs> custom. I don't think it meant good riddance either. Uh, on the same commune, uh, maybe these can be focused also. Thank you. Uh, the, a picture outside the house and uh, a picture inside the house. This was a two-room house. There, were, uh, there was a family of four living in the two rooms. One area was kind of kitchen, living, dining room, and the other room with a curtain and some freestanding storage units was a sleeping area. Then there was, they did some cooking there, but most of the cooking was done in a, a communal, communal area. These particular people had their own garden patch and a couple of pigs, which they sold for additional money beyond the money they uh, received working in the commune. I should uh, mention here a little bit about clothing in China. Certainly the majority of people still wear uh, what's referred to as, uh, as a Mao suit. These come in all kinds of colors, blues, and mostly in, in blues, grays, and greens. However, when we were there in 1977, something very interesting was developing because polyester mouse suits had become the big hit. And these cotton suits um, in our dollars were about $8. And most of us wanted to buy one to take back. And um, we were buying, both because we liked cotton and because they were only about $8, we were buying the cotton ones. The polyester ones were about $17 or $18, and the Chinese could not understand why we weren't buying the polyester ones, both because, obviously, if you came from halfway around the world, you had money to spend, you know, $17. They knew what didn't, wasn't all that much to us, but um, they found that rather mind-boggling, that we didn't want the polyester ones. But clothing's changing very rapidly. We're seeing more and more plaids, flowered blouses, Women, for the first time, are beginning. First time in recent years, are beginning to wear uh, skirts. There are even Western-style suits available for businessmen now. We saw the first evidences of um, women wearing makeup, and I understand now, particularly in the larger urban areas such as Sh Shanghai, that um, women, uh, some women, are, are wearing makeup now. Uh, very little jewelry watches, but um, rarely, very rare to see any kind of, of, of jewelry. But the people are very, very interested in, in clothing, and it will be interesting to see as uh, what effect that has on the future of China. Just to back up for a moment, I wanted to mention on the right, uh, these, this is in a, a convalescent home, uh, some uh, adults doing uh, ex an exercise I'm not sure if this is Tai Chi. I'm not sure what this particular uh, one was. But adults exercise a lot. It's not unusual at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning to see great numbers of adults, even uh, elderly people, doing knee, deep knee bends out on the street. Without any doubt, it's the most fit, physically fit group of people I've ever seen any, any place. Um, just... You know, it's kind of mind-boggling, the sense of physical fitness in China. Here we were leaving the rural school, uh, more uh, applauding going on, having toured the classrooms. Um, and on the right, in the countryside, a group of high school students out on a, a long walk, uh, a tour. Um, sometimes they'll go for very long, uh, actually, high school students from the inner city will go for several weeks in the countryside to work uh, as part of their high school curriculum. And they'll go on 
it's not unusual to, to walk the 40 miles to the rural counterpart of the inner city school. Again, could you try to, to focus these a little bit? I would do it here, but I, I don't think these work. Um, other examples of uh, the kind of exposure we had to education within the school, we visited uh, a middle school, uh, grade school, nursery school, kindergarten, and we saw um, both the students performing, but also actually sat in on, on quite a few classes, talked with the administrators in the school. I, could, I would love to go into much more detail about their curriculum, about, for example, the range of foreign language options that the students have in high school. Uh, in Peking, for example, uh, of course we were shown the better high schools, um, but Arabic, increasingly English, uh, a, a great number of, of foreign uh, language options. Plus, the students actually do work in the workshops in the school. For example, in electronics, they do, piece, they do piece work on transistors, which is actually used in, in they go out and, and are put into uh, transistors in the assembly line. So the work that they do is actually uh, useful work. One of the most interesting days was our visit in Nanking to the Nanking Technical Engineering Institute. I always get that name slightly uh, wrong, but I think, I think that's close. Um, we visited the School of Architecture. It was approximately the same size as our School of Architecture, about 150 students. We met with students, faculty, and administrators. This on the left is a shot um, looking at the, that's the School of Architecture building in the background. Unfortunately, I, I don't know Chinese, and I didn't always, wasn't always able to have translated for me and, and to note what these slogans are saying. Uh, and in fact, it might be embarrassing. They may even be in backwards. I, I hope not. Um, on the right is a, a model. The skills we saw in terms of model making were impressive. Now, to us, these buildings may look, uh, in terms of design, somewhat dated. I suppose some people could put that in the 30s or 40s. But um, again, this would take a great deal of time to go into detail to sort out for you the types of emphases they have within the School of Architecture. I'll, I'll note a few things. For example, almost all of the design projects they work on are real projects, real buildings which will be built. They do the models, uh, let's say Ball Memorial Hospital was deciding to do a new wing. There would be faculty within the School of Architecture in addition to city architects involved designing it as a school project. Then they would do the working drawings, the supervision, build the model. So the, the work done in the school is useful work and is consistent with their uh, ideological position of uh, practical things being given more emphasis than other issues such as aesthetic issues. They're becoming increasingly interested in dealing with aesthetics and theory because they feel that at this point in time in terms of their architectural development that problems of quantity, problems of housing vast numbers of their 900 uh, million people are beginning to be under control and now they can think much more about quality, about aesthetics and in the final year program, each student in the, in the final thesis class must write a theoretical position paper um, on the work that he or she has done. Um, another statistic might, that might interest you, out of 150 students, there are 23 women. Um, I, I would love to go into much more detail in terms of the curriculum, um, the types of facilities, I mentioned uh, this morning to some people that I was rather naive and interested to discover when I went into their library that there were all of the things that you look at, uh, progressive architecture, domus, um, Canadian architect, you know, they were all um, there and they look at those journals very carefully and um, when I asked what relevance they had to China, they said, well, um, 
as they're so fond of doing using statistics, they said, we estimate that 95% of the material is irrelevant to us, but we have to read them to find the 5% that is relevant to us. On the left, an example of a tea house design, a uh, kind of tea house resort place proposed for a lake in China. On the right is a rather poor, gloomy shot because it was a, a rainy day of the Nanking River Bridge. It's a very uh, major engineering feat, and that was designed at the Nanking Technical Institute by students and faculty. So I put in this one example of, of uh, something that was executed. Now, shifting uh, from education to looking briefly at uh, science and technology, this is the Shanghai Industrial, uh, I forget whether it's called Pavilion, Shanghai Industrial Exhibition. Shanghai Industrial Exhibition is an enormous kind of fairgrounds complex which was built in the 50s, designed by Russian architects. I think you can uh, see the, the Russian influence in this building. Um, again, very, very fine materials, very carefully detailed. There's a close-up on the right of the main entry. Here at this exhibition, as I mentioned before, there is sort of one of a kind of everything being produced. It's a place where the Chinese bring um, industrialists from all over the world to show them examples of the work, and of, uh, it's also, a, of course, a, a public museum. Um, everything from um, heavy industrial equipment, um, high technology equipment, to everyday things such as sewing machines. The, these pictures are going back to the, uh, one of the hospitals we visited in the rural commune. And this is showing you some of the medical equipment, which again seemed rather primitive in, by our standards, but which they were quite, uh, quite proud to show us. We were shown factories under construction as well as factories in operation. Uh, on the left was a factory, uh, a new building being constructed uh, for, um, was going to, where building components were going to be manufactured. And on the right, you see uh, part of our visit to a silk factory. By all means, you should not miss out uh, on the silk factory. That was one of the most enjoyable factory visits we had to see how the cocoons are taken and unwound and eventually do, uh, silk cloth coming out the other end. Of course, one of the most interesting aspects of, of science and technology for us was in the architectural building end of the spectrum. And we requested visits to a lot of building sites, and they were very cooperative. Um, it's a strange combination of, of industrialized building and the most basic kind of handcrafted labor. And uh, one, one leaves with the impression that uh, although there is so much, all this prefabrication and an attempt at industrialization is going on that the success and uh, the, the actual execution depends so much on kind of how somebody's packing mud into uh, one of the forms. And we saw lots of evidences of, uh, of very, we thought, very sloppy workmanship. We asked them about it. How could this a form work, a piece of form work with concrete being, being put into it and a whole corner, maybe a seven or eight inch area, not even being filled or falling off when it came out of the form. And they would come back to us with some uh, 
discussion about the dialectics between quantity and quality and how, of course, next year the quality would be improved, but this year the quantity had to be raised. Um, but, but the discussions were very, were very, uh, were very revealing. The safety standards on the job seemed very poor to us, and we got into really some arguments, some rather heated arguments with them about what seemed to be very bad protection for the workers. Few, uh, little protection in terms of noise in the factories, uh, poor uh, protection of feet and eyes, and uh, they, they all, all they could explain really was that uh, those things were being worked on, they recognized the inadequacy, uh, but that they were being improved. We found it strange because in a country which has so much emphasis on the care and the well-being of, of the masses of people, it seemed to be uh, somehow very contradictory not to have better protection for the workers on the, on the job. <clears throat> well. Shifting from some contemporary uh, industrialized architecture, I'll show you some evidences of the historical things we saw. This is in Peking in the Forbidden City, uh, an enormous uh, imperial complex which is being restored. And I would say it's some of the most immaculate restoration work I've ever seen. Um, again, why the restoration work would be done so seemingly perfectly and the other housing work was done so shoddily uh, would be explained there by the fact that the housing was not for everyone, whereas this situation uh, was exposed and was to be enjoyed by everyone. And it was interesting that um, in visiting these historical sites, the people really do use them. It's not uncommon to see a family sitting on a um, marble railing which has just been restored, um, having a picnic. And almost all of these things are free, and they're great kinds of uh, public parks. And uh, the museums have a very different sense. It's not a kind of as many of our museums are a kind of holy, don't touch me uh, attitude, there, they, there's this sense that they're very much for the people to use and to experience. Uh, a couple of architectural details from the uh, Forbidden City. I forget exactly which building. I'd have to go back through my notes. I forget exactly which building, uh, there are hundreds of buildings in the compound. The, on the right is a detail of, uh, of a floor. Now, within our curriculum, our students, during their study and travel abroad, each have to work on an independent study project. The majority of our students worked on their projects during the 11 weeks in Japan partly because it was a greater amount of time and they had more independent time, uh, but also just because it was much easier in terms of language to get to resources. We did have a few students who concentrated on uh, projects in China. I'll show you a few examples of one of those a bit uh, later. But students were not only photographing and looking at these things, but a lot of them were asking, asking very detailed questions which uh, helped them in their own independent study work. The students then completed the work when they came back to Halifax and it was exhibited and reviewed by a faculty student uh, committee. Um, some other rather traditional shots of roofscapes. The gold tile, the gold ceramic tile was, re was uh, reserved for the imperial family. Only, only buildings for the imperial family could have gold tiles. On the right is a tea house. Uh, we visited at that particular one. Some, we would often stop along the way at tea houses and we were served tea and we would have discussion. This particular one we were just um, walking through, just looking around. The furniture was quite interesting there. 
This I found to be one of the most interesting places architecturally. Uh, this was in that same town I showed before with the canals, a place called Roussy. Most of these buildings are from the 16th and 17th century and parallel certain um, Baroque developments in Europe. And uh, again, it's something I knew very little about before. Before you go, you should do absolutely as much reading and preparing as you can. Um, but the, the whole texture of this area was quite beautiful because the buildings were all uh, stuccoed, uh, whitewashed buildings with a consistent roof tile. This was called the, the Dragon Wall. And you see on the right, this garden wall tumbling down is the dragon's tail. And then the dragon wall ends here with the dragon's head, uh, which is actually an inhabitable, uh, habitable structure. Uh, it was kind of a marvelous, marvelous place. But the, the whole kind of undulating and consistently whitewashed approach uh, in that village was fascinating. Well, to shift rather radically to some, this will just be a rather quick overview of the variety and the types of architecture, the, kind, the historical, the more vernacular, and here two other things on, on the right, some more of the heavily Soviet-influenced architecture here. At a, uh, I don't know the function of that building, probably uh, some kind of official uh, state government place in a public square in Nanking. Um, you'll notice in many of these slides the paired portraits of Mao and Hua, and those were everywhere. And it's going to be very interesting. I've heard that as recently as, uh, as a few months ago that Mao and Hua were every place when we were there, every classroom, every public place. And I think now, uh, the, the Mao, photo, Mao portraits and photographs are being, if not, uh, if not fewer, well, fewer if at all. I, I think it would be very interesting to see what's happening in terms of public uh, portraiture and, and just who and how who's being promoted at the, at the moment. Um, but the scale of that kind of uh, public uh, political art was very very interesting to us. On the left is one of the new hotels in uh, Peking. This is the, the top hotel in Peking, uh, not far from Tiananmen Square. We, this is, we did not stay at the hotel, this hotel. The hotel we stayed at looks very, very similar to this in terms of the architecture. Um, it appeared in an earlier slide, and I forgot to point it out. Uh, the place where we stayed was the Nationalities Hotel, and it was really kind of number two hotel, because uh, when we were there, it was the first anniversary of, of Mao's death, and this one was filled up with international um, dignitaries. But this shows the kind of, um, oh, I would label it as kind of, fifth, to us, maybe one might call it kind of 50s international style, which dominates uh, a lot of the present building in, in China. Looking again at some of the housing, you can see what is to me a kind of less than satisfactory uh, level of detail. We were able to go walk through all of this take pictures from the inside of window details and to see the plans, talk with the architects, talk about the heating system. Um, you'd be surprised, for example, to find that many of the buildings have absolutely no heating system. In winter, in some areas, the temperature, even in the south, is as low as 40 or 50 degrees in the winter. And uh, the expectation is that people will simply put on more clothing or maybe use some small charcoal stove. So in terms of of heating, ventilating systems, very often there are none, but uh, plumbing, bath and the bathroom and kitchen facilities are becoming uh, much better to the point where now a typical family moving into a new building will have its own uh, bathroom and kitchen within the apartment. 
they have, they, they're doing, I think, some very, very innovative work with how to use natural lighting. They're very energy conscious. conscious because, of course, their whole energy problem is, is, they kind of laugh when, when we ask them about the energy problem there because they say, well, we, you know, I mean, so many places don't even have one electric light bulb yet. So their energy problem is so totally different. And preservation is at a scale that it's much, much different of, than ours because it has, it's much more at a planning scale. For example, they used, they are using waste heat from industrial plants to heat whole housing areas in the areas where they're, they're starting to use uh, uh, some heating now. It's still fairly new. Uh, some details from the inside whole prefabricated window door section set in rather crudely. That will be set in maybe some minimal caulking around the thing, no finishing of window sills uh, or anything like that, just the concrete, the steel, some glazing. It's not unusual even in a new building to see with, with glazing, for example, let's take this lower left-hand uh, square which hasn't been glazed yet. And that, that may be glazed with two pieces of old glass butted together because they'll use scraps of glass. Nothing, no, there's just no, so little waste. They cannot afford with 900 million people in a rather undeveloped country to waste anything. Uh, but it makes an interesting looking thing to us to see a, a new building with kind of old pieces of broken glass being put together in a kind of mosaic. Um, and on the right, uh, an older window detail, which I found uh, it's almost deco-ish, I found very interesting. And just a couple of other uh, examples of, of housing, places under construction. And on the right, a, a very interesting place of uh, kind of workers' housing, entryways into uh, workers' housing in uh, Peking. I guess the Aldo Rossi fans may have some excitement here. Some housing from the 50s, which I thought was quite successful. We visited a family there, and this high, uh, or rather kind of medium density, low rise housing, walk up with fairly pleasant gardens where people could grow vegetables uh, and shopping spaces nearby schools seem to be working and seem to be maintained very well. In many ways, some of that looked to me potentially more uh, successful than the 20-story high-rise buildings. But their argument is that they will continue to do some of this, but the 20-story high-rises are much more efficient in terms of getting quantity of space built. Another look at the Nanking River Bridge, which was an interesting combination of a transportation system, highway on the upper level, railroad on the middle level, and then the bridge pylons. The supports are uh, actually a building which contained the bridge authority administrative offices plus a museum showing the whole history and development of the Nanking River Bridge. So on the right, for example, is a model uh, which is in the museum. Here on the left, some of our students um, in their Canadian rain gear. On one of, well, actually, we had really wonderful weather. This was one of the few rainy days we had. I also very much liked these great uh, flags on top of the pylons, and they're kind of static flags, which are made to look like they're waving a bit in the wind. And then at night, they have little light bulbs all around the whole flag. They're, they're really kind of pop in a way, at least from my point of, my way of looking at it, they seem like great kind of pop flags. But you'll see also the little light bulbs streaming down the side. And the Chinese do that quite often in public buildings. It, it, it makes a very heavy building, at least at night, very delicate. And, and, and uh, it's not just a, a seasonal thing, it's a, it's a year-round device. Uh, a decorative device. Uh, and finally, in this architecture section, one of the important new monuments, 
You'll see in the background there uh, the mausoleum built for Mao was completed uh, about a month before we were there. It was built in one year's time uh, and con finished for September 77 for the uh, first anniversary of Mao's death. And there were great parades and um, thousands and thousands of people. And we were able to get kind of caught up in all of that celebrating. And it was really uh, a spectacle. I'd never been in such a huge crowd. Um, and you can begin to grasp the scale of, the, of that square. Two other shots of the, uh, of the mausoleum, which was a strange kind of, to our eyes, a strange kind of in-between traditional, modern, I mean, they're kind of, um, I suppose, some flashbacks to the Boston City Hall aesthetic that kind of overlaid with the tile traditional, uh, some traditional Chinese motifs. And on the left, uh, some school children and teachers' drawings out in the rural commune uh, of, of the mausoleum. It's a very popular architectural image now. Um, now, shifting from architecture, just to show you examples of the various types of art we saw, I mentioned earlier in almost every pub public situation we were in, uh, pictures of uh, leaders of Marx, Lenin, uh, on the right, uh, Mao, and I think it's Mao and Hua. This was a big billboard. Uh, I would refer to it as a piece of public art um, that was actually being done and was completed while it was right outside our hotel in uh, Nanking. And the kind of uh, social realism, super realism uh, was, was quite an interesting thing to see for us. Other examples on the right, a sculptural example of uh, social realism. On the big building in the back, this is a, a hotel in Shanghai, that black building. Again, a very interesting kind of someplace between 20s deco and kind of 30s streamlined modern. Uh, very interesting building, uh, but with stars as political decorative devices. And an example of a contemporary ceramic piece, which also carries a political message through the uh, star. I became very interested in stars as decorative devices, how a political symbol was making the transition into a popular symbol. You can see on the left here, uh, a, this is a label from uh, a beer bottle with the stars Again, uh, students collected beer bottle labels like they're going out of style. And every time they'd have to, we'd have to sit in a bar in the hotel. They were wetting the labels and trying to slip them off the, the bottle. And were, they were actually quite successful in coming back with a great uh, array of, of labels. And on the right is uh, a Shanghai beer label, which I manipulated into uh, a collage study. I found one way of recording images for me was to make my own postcards. And I did a whole series of uh, postcards using collage. They actually ended up being a combination of Japanese and Chinese uh, images. But I, these, these were to me an example of commercial art. 12 cents for a big bottle of beer, for those of you who are, in, who are interested. Some other examples of art, the uh, peasant, painting on the left. Uh, this was, I think, from some weekend magazine. I don't remember whether it was Canadian or one of the New York Times things, but it was um, an example of the, of the peasant art done in a very realistic style, carrying different uh, types of political uh, messages, kind of messages within messages, because there's the, the painting that's about a woman um, serving her rural brigade, and she's, she's painting a, a painting 
that's political, and on the bed is her political material, and, there, and it's a kind of multi-layered political images on top of political images. And the Chinese can go on telling you about what colors are the correct colors in terms of, of the use of colors and so on. On the right was one of the most interesting pieces I found. I saw this in a what's referred to as an arts and crafts factory, because most artists, unlike here, are not allowed to work independently. There's no kind of art architecture star system. People work collectively. And in this arts and crafts factory, they made awards, um, plaques. It would be like a trophy factory, in other words. So this was going to be given to uh, some group who had achieved some production level within their brigade or in the factory. And um, I would have to go back to my notes. I don't know what it says, but it's, it's a kind of honor saying so-and-so had achieved this. And it's uh, a combination of natural landscape with birds and trees and flowers it's a kind of silk material built up. The, what looks like a green paper cup is, in fact, pale green corrugated paper. And then you see the other layer of industrial landscape. And it's, it's that interest that the Chinese have in integrating technology, uh, the rural environment with the urban environment. Um, and um, in terms of collage, uh, I, I found the whole thing to be one of the most interesting pieces of art. And then the kind of, you can barely see the frame is pale green and then a purple band around it. And I thought it was a, a very good piece of, of folk art. And I asked them to take it out of the factory. The light was very poor. And I asked if they would take it outside so I could photograph it in natural light. And they said, yes, they would be pleased to do that. And I made the comment that I said, I thought this was very fine, very exceptional work. And they said, yes, it, it was very fine work. And they recognized that, indeed, there were um, certainly kind of pinnacles of achievement within the factory where there, there were artists. Uh, in other words, they were quite willing to accept that there were artists who, uh, at certain moments in time, uh, achieved uh, something very special. And um, they, they liked that piece very much also. Uh, so a couple of examples of folk art. Many um, examples of, of traditional art, the famous ceramic dragon wall on the left. Uh, I think, I forget the name of that bird, Chinese bird. Um, and so the, there's a great range of, of artistic expression from different periods, which we were able to enjoy and to record. Uh, I'm coming to the last two sections, uh, the last groups of slides. Continuing um, the kind of art architecture emphasis, I want to show you a group of slides of gateways in China. I'm showing you these not only because I find uh, the range of expression to be fascinating, the kind of ingenuity in the use of materials, but also because it's these slides uh, are slides taken by one of our students who did his entire uh, term's work on the study of gateways in China. And I'm only showing you some of his slides. He had approximately uh, 200 slides of gateways, which he photographed in China. He was usually out at 5.30 in the morning uh, tracking down gateways. He, he, what he would have to do very often, if we were on a tour one afternoon, he would make notes about gateways he saw, because there wasn't always time to record them, mentally record where they were in the city, because we had very poor maps of the city, and then go out at 5.30 the next morning, walk very fast back, and photograph some of them. But he eventually did a whole series of drawings, a paper, uh, a visual, and, and written analysis of the meaning, uh, as he saw it, and the kinds of expression uh, in gateways in China, and gave a couple of presentations at school. And he looked at both traditional gateways, such as this monumental one on the left, and a very modern uh, gateway on the right, 
which is made up of just very simple materials. Sometimes these things are made of painted cardboard and scrap and decorated again with little light bulbs, but you can see they're reproducing traditional columns with, uh, it's very much like that folk painting I showed you previously on the right, where uh, it's a kind of collage at a large scale with everyday materials. Uh, some other examples, uh, this student, Brian, um, looked at gates from many points of view, in terms of form relationships, in terms of uh, historical period, in terms of color, um, and I think you can see some of the pairing. Um, these were not his pairs. He loaned me some slides, so I may be misinterpreting and not getting quite correct his pairing up. But it was a fascinating study, and um, Again, it was demonstrating the fact that students and I had time, we really had to work at it, but it was worth it to be able to concentrate on some particular thing in China as a way of understanding more deeply what the Chinese people were about and, and to get some kind of perspective uh, on, on Chinese uh, culture. Uh, two other gateways on the right, you see, uh, I'm sure they wouldn't refer to it as super graphics, but uh, we don't have anything on the Chinese in terms of super graphics. This on the left was an entrance to a small school. Um, again, other comparisons of formal relationships, a beautiful sequence of monumental spaces on the right, beginning with this gateway to Dr. Sun Yat-sen's uh, memorial and monument. And possibly two of my favorites, traditional gateways. Uh, I think these are, are beautiful examples of ways to puncture and to go through a wall and to make a very dramatic transition from as a framing one, from one situation to another. On the left, a, a traditional gate in the Forbidden City. And on the right, uh, a gateway doorway uh, in Wuxi that um, city I showed you before with the whitewashed dragon wall and the canals. Uh, and now leading into my, some of my own concerns at that time and fascination with stars are actually two gateways of various types with stars. On the left, a gateway in Shanghai left from the colonial period when the British and the Dutch and other Northern Europeans were in control of Shanghai. Uh, uh, this gateway is left from that co colonial period, uh, but with the star added as another layer of more current uh, popular and, and political interest. On the right, an, a new rural school we visited, uh, and I quite like that uh, round traditional Chinese moon gate in rural local materials and then looking through to the star uh, beyond. So I have had a long time interest in stars. I'm doing some um, writing now about stars in terms of their political, popular meaning, uh, how we use the word star as in uh, starship, superstar, Hollywood star, um, but even in China, it's changing, and I had a lot of interesting discussions through our interpreters. He said five years ago, it would have been some kind of sacrilege to use a star as has been used here on a snap on the covering of a bus seat. And I actually have stars of, of or photographs on stars on uh, all kinds of everyday things. On the right's one of the, the wreaths. Um, here, uh, an interesting piece of folk architecture where a railing was made on the rural commune. Here's a, a railing with the rising sun and the star. And on the right, on a, the stack on a boat. On the left, the, over the entrance doorway to the Shanghai Industrial Exhibition. On the right, decoration over a public bulletin board in Shanghai. And finally, 
on the right, the star in the Great Hall of the People in Peking, and on the left, a page from my own notebook where I was beginning several, well, a year ago to formulate some of the ideas that uh, I hope will be published later this year in a final form. I was simply recording some sketches and ideas about organization of material on the upper left, and then um, just thinking about three-dimensional uh, possibilities of, of star-shaped buildings in a kind of cartoon uh, recording way and how a building could have uh, different fa facades. I think very much some of this was a reaction to this fact that in China we saw so many different types of architecture, the Soviet-inspired, uh, the traditional, the modern, the folk, brick kind of people's architecture, and then what I was doing was documenting those four through my notes and finally saying, well, how could that be expanded into some of my uh, own interests? Um, that completes the slides, and I would be pleased if we have time to take some questions from, from the audience. that was vague when I was mentioning that statistic and uh, it's a it's it's sometimes they would tell us when and other times they would not and whether that was um, how recent that was I don't know I had the sense that it was a fairly uh, recent situation say within the, within the 20th century Sometimes they would give us an exact year, but in this case, the dating was rather vague. So I, can't, I cannot give you a, a clear answer to that. What, um, what thing would you say is the most contrary to the stereotypes and preconceptions of what you thought would have gone? Some of you probably can't hear the questions. Uh, the, the question was, what did we find to be the most uh, surprising or contrary to our expectations? Um, I, I, I think I could give maybe three answers. It would be difficult for me to zero in on one thing. One thing we were very naive about was the amount of flexibility and mobility we would have on our own. In other words, I was very surprised to find that if it midnight, I wanted to leave the hotel and go for a walk, go down the street to the, see that stores, a lot of stores are kept open all night long because people work on shifts around the clock. So if I wanted to go for a walk and go down to the store, and in fact, the first night I was in Peking, I left the hotel about midnight, walked up the street to a little shop and bought this booklet. And I could walk, leave the hotel early in the morning as I usually did and walk any place. I was never stopped or questioned. So the amount of freedom we had um, to go places was surprising. I was naive. We were all naive about that. Uh, another thing was the sense of contentment and happiness. And I must say that's a very big puzzle to me in my mind to this day because on, I was in uh, Washington for a few days before I came here and flying on the plane the airport, I picked up the current issue of Newsweek. And I think the current one, I don't know if I got the Canadian one or the American one or if it's the same. I don't know, it, I don't know if any of you have seen one, but there's a current issue, I think, of, uh, that deals with China, a special issue. I read the entire thing. I read every word. And I must say, I felt enormously disturbed by the way that article was written and what I read in that article. Because the sense that I got in that article was about how 
oh, how wonderful now with this with the change in China. And I don't I don't doubt that it's going to be in many ways be very positive step. I mean, I think Chinese want to know more about the world, and the sense of isolation was probably very negative. But I'm getting off the subject. But getting back to this article, throughout it there was the sense of oh, how miserable the Chinese have been. What an incredible break it's going to be now for the Chinese to have TVs, to have um, all of these consumer things. I mean, how, how many they're going to have is another question. The change will come very slowly. But this sense in this article that the Chinese were so deprived and so un unhappy. Now, we, of course, were directed in our travels. We didn't see everything. I'm sure there are great pockets of, of poverty and suffering in China that we never saw. But we were able to walk around freely through the city, and there was a, like, I can only describe it as a sense of contentment and happiness that I have never seen traveling other places. Now, that's, that's my own response. Different students saw it different ways. Some agreed with me and some different. But, uh, and, I, and as I say, uh, you know, the, it's a hard thing for me to reconcile because I know that things aren't always what they seem. But to answer your question, I was very surprised at this sense of contentment and well-being. Um, so two things. The third thing I'll mention, uh, I won't go into too much detail, uh, this is sort of an opposite side of the coin. I guess I did not realize how underdeveloped China is. I didn't somehow expect to see pigs being pulled to market by a cart with four people with the cart strapped to their back and the pig squealing on the cart which is just you know, a medieval kind of thing. Um, and it, it's like um, going back to something that I had never, of course, never experienced. And that was very, very surprising. Some people have asked us why uh, we can't tell them about a trip like this with cost right away. Like we can't we decide to go to London. Could you explain something about uh, your cost? I can give you some figures on the on the cost. It gets complicated because some of the figures are, are in Canadian dollars. Uh, last year, at this time, there was not a great difference between the Canadian and American dollar. Unfortunately, there is now. Um, our costs. Okay, I'll give you these statistics. Our round trip flight from Vancouver to Tokyo was $660. Our round trip, our flight from uh, Tokyo to Peking plus the flight from Shanghai back to Tokyo, in other words, Japan, China, and back, was $430. The 18 days in China, all inclusive, uh, very good hotels. We ate an em embarrassingly well. All the tickets to performances, uh, circus. I, I didn't take time to tell you, you know, going to the th acrobatics, going to the circus, going to performances and things like that. Anyway, all the travel within China on train, bus, travel, hotel, food, uh, events was 400, um, 467. I may have. The round trip plane was 433. The travel within China was 466. In other words, going to China, traveling in China, going back to Japan amounted to $900. Now, considering how comfortable we were and what we got to see, uh, that was very reasonable for the 18 days. Um, so I don't know. You can add that up if you're thinking in terms of getting from North America to China, doing the China thing and coming back, which is roughly a three-week, say from the West Coast, is a three-week thing. That adds up to, um, what, 660 plus 900 is 1,550 Canadian dollars a year and a half ago. Now, if you do some 
translating, uh, I don't know what it would cost now, in American dollars. Uh, the expenses in Japan, I think we, you have to very much separate the two things, because I still have the sense that if you can get approval for the trip to Japan, or rather China, that it's one of the travel bargains, if you want to look at it that way. I mean, the, the educational experience is something you should, I mean, I say work every minute between now and then to accomplish, but if you want to look at it in terms of, of what you get for your money, uh, I mean, I think it's still one of the bargains of, of the present. Japan is another story. Um, we were there 11 weeks. Um, our students spent in the 11 weeks any place from, I would say, a low of $2,500 to closer to $5,000. It was a big range, because people live different ways. Some kind of, you know, just eked by on, on very minimal kind of lifestyle, and, and others who had more money lived more uh, luxuriously. But um, it depended, there was a, an incredible range. But let's say um, around $3,000 for the 11 weeks in Japan. Now, just to give you an idea what's happened with the exchange rate, it changed dramatically while we were there, and now the, uh, in Canadian dollars, it would cost us um, 50, 60 percent more than it did 18 months ago. So it would be impossible for most of our students now, uh, for the majority, to go back to Japan. I, I'm, I'm just being realistic. I'm not. I'm being real, realistic about both. I'm saying I think it's very realistic in terms of money for most students now to think about going to China, because um, uh, internally China is still very reasonable. But Japan, the dollar situation is not very good. Japan is very expensive. You have to be prepared for a dollar twenty, dollar thirty for a cup of coffee. It's no exaggeration. Um, and it's just, it's a very expensive place. Our trip was successful. It was, it was equally exciting to China. I decided not to, I thought it would be confusing to talk about both here. I didn't want to mix the two because they're quite different uh, culturally and, and what we did there was very different. Um, but I guess I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. If, if there are no more questions, the one thing I would like to say, um, it's, it's also a long ways, and, and I guess kind of, uh, in, unless you like to drive or, or hitchhike, it's a long ways to Nova Scotia. Um, but I'd like to, an extend, like to extend an invitation to all of you to visit our school sometime. Having taught here, I've told our faculty and students many times about uh, what a fine school you have here. We get lots of your reports and things, so um, we're always interested in maintaining communication and contact. So if any of you ever, if any faculty or students ever have the opportunity to visit Nova Scotia, we will put out the welcome mat and try to show you a good time. And we hope that someday some of you will be able to uh, visit us also. Thank you.